Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is entitled In the Crucible with Christ. Hmm, that doesn't even sound friendly. This is lesson number eight for August 20th, 2022, entitled Seeing the Invisible. Well, that like, sounds like a good thing to do. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Father God, we come before you now recognizing your presence with us at all times, but recognizing especially now that we have this opportunity today to study your word and think about you and discuss it together. May we, in fact, learn how to see the invisible as our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Do you find it to be challenging to worship something you cannot see? This is one of the problems that the ancient Israelites had. They wanted something they could see and handle and touch, and especially something that they could manipulate themselves. But God is beyond our manipulation. You didn't have to add that they wanted to manipulate God, did you? I did have to add that. Jim? Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 and 27. To have faith is to be sure of things we hope for, to be certain of things we cannot see. Verse 27, it was faith that made Moses leave Egypt without being afraid of the king's anger. As though he saw the invisible God, he refused to turn back, the American Bible Society, Good News Translation. From yeah. the Bible study guide, it is even more challenging to realize that we are called to see, quotes, him who is invisible, end quote. Not simply when times are good, but especially when everything is going wrong. For this we need faith, a Christ-like faith that must be shaped by the truth about God and God's kingdom. The truth about our Father's goodness, the power in the name of Jesus, the power the power of the resurrection and the compassion of God are essential truths that will be, enable us to stand strong when we are in the crucible and may be tempted to doubt everything from the Bible study guide for August 13. What is the power in the name of Jesus? What does that mean? Well, you know, there's a song about that. I do. That's why I'm asking. Yeah. There's power in the blood. People believe that if you just use the name, there's there are many Christians who believe very strongly that if and and I know of stories where people who who have been threatened with demon possession have said Jesus, you know, I pray in the name of Jesus and the devils leave. So in those kind of situations, I think there is power in the name. Well, isn't there? If you understand God's name, is is His character. Mm -hmm. and uh, you study his character, you study his life. And sure. uh, like Paul says in Romans 5.10, it's, it's, uh, it's life-giving. Mm -hmm. So then the question for us here to really sort of set the foundation for this lesson is the question of faith. Uh, a biblical definition of faith so stated so well so many times by one of God's best modern friends and my personal mentor, Dr. A. Graham Maxwell, is as follows. Carrie? How would you define faith? No. Faith oh, is... Sorry. Yeah, faith is just a word we use to denote a relationship with God as with a person well known. The better we know him, the better this relationship may be. And in brackets, we cannot say will be because we know of the story of Lucifer. Faith Think how long he knew God. Yes. And how close he was to him. Yeah. He yes. was his right hand, right hand man, you yeah. could say. Yes. Faith implies an attitude toward God of love, trust, and deep admiration. It means having enough confidence in him based upon the more than adequate evidence revealed to be willing to believe whatever he says and in brackets as soon as we are sure that he is the one who has said it to accept whatever he offers 
as soon as we are sure that he is the one who is offering it, and to do whatever he wishes, again in brackets, as soon as we are sure he is the one who wishes it, without reservation for the rest of eternity. Anyone who has such faith is perfectly safe to save. This is why faith is the only requirement for heaven. In brackets again, faith also means that like Abraham, Job, and Moses, God's friends, we know God well enough to reverently ask him why. And that's from Graham Maxwell. You can trust the Bible, page 81. Very good. Content in brackets is added based on frequent statements by Dr. Maxwell. Yeah, he, he, he used this, referent, this definition frequently and yeah. quoted it, and he would add... Not some, quite every week, but close. <laughs> yeah. The truth about God in contrast to the truth about Satan is the basis of the great controversy. Our faith is based on knowing the truth about God. And you remember that way back in the beginning, Satan tried to claim, even back in heaven, that if we, if we would just let everyone be selfish, we could have a better government than God's government, which is based on love. And uh, you know uh, how that worked out. It was still working out, I should ask. Uh, God, does God sometimes seem to be far away? How many times do you wish God would do something for you or for others, and you know he is capable of doing it, but it does not happen? It may be something that is good, like healing someone's cancer, or we are certain that God would love to do that, or maybe something in our experience seems to be in contradiction to God's goodness. So from our Bible study guide. BS2. Carl, Bible study guide. Oh, thank you. If something looks good, or feels good, or sounds good, or tastes good, then it must be good. And so we get angry with God when we can't have it. Adult Bible school class, yeah. uh, Bible study guide. So how does faith come into play in such situations? Are we tempted to doubt God's goodness? In Romans 8, 29, 26 to 39, wh where we are told in unquestionable language that all three members of the Godhead are on our side and working for us, nothing can separate us from them except our own choice. And Myra, read us. This is a very, very significant passage. Oh, it's a very long one, too. From the message. Okay. Oh, yeah. this is from the message. Probably. Yeah, we're, we're going to give you a different translation. And, and I do that once in a while. In this particular case, I've done it because I want not to just use the familiar words. We can sort of slide over them, just or let them go in one ear and out the other. If you listen in a modern translation, this is a paraphrase. It's not even a direct translation. It's a paraphrase, but... It, Hopefully it'll make us think. Okay. Meanwhile, the moment we get tired of waiting, God's Spirit is right along, right alongside us, helping us along. If we don't know how or what to pray, it doesn't matter. He does our praying in and for us, making prayer out of our wordless sighs, our aching groans. Hmm. God knows us far better than we know ourselves, knows our pregnant condition, and keeps a, us present before Him, before God. That's why we can be so sure that every detail in our lives of love for God is worked into something good. Now, that particular passage, that last sentence, I'm a little... It's all right. I... I I wish he'd put the name of God earlier because the Greek literally says God works in everything for good. So go ahead. God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the onset to shape our lives for those who love him along the same lines as the life of his son. The son stands first in line of humanity he restored. He sees we see the original and intended shape of our lives there in him. After God made the decision of what his children should be like, he followed it up by calling people by name. After he called them by name, he set them on a solid basis with himself. 
and then after getting them established, he stayed with them to the end, gloriously completing what he had begun. Myra, why don't you let Gordon read the rest of that? Okay. Um, so it's a long passage. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Verse 31 plus. So what do you think? With God on our side like this, how can we lose? If God didn't, didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition and exposing himself to the worst by sending his own son, is there anything else he wouldn't gladly and freely do for us? And who would dare tangle with God by messing with one of God's chosen? How do you like that? Who would dare even to point a finger? The one who died for us, who was raised to life for us, is in the presence of God at this very moment, sticking up for us. Do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There is no way, not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins listed in Scripture. And there are a lot of bad sins listed in yes. Scripture. They kill us in cold blood because they hate you. We're, stick, we're sitting ducks. They pick us off one by one. None of this phases us because Jesus loves us. I am absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our master, has embraced us by Eugene Peterson in the message, the contemporary Bible oh. and contemporary language. What do you think of that? Pretty good, huh? It's colorful. Yes. After God sent his son at the risk of losing the great controversy and the trust of the entire universe to try to win us back, is it possible that he could ever be mean and stingy? What should we do when we are tempted to doubt God's trust and love and goodness. Of course, the first choice should be to think about what God has already done for us. But more than that, we have certain promises from Jesus himself. John 14, 14, Jesus said, and I will do whatever you ask for in my name so that the Father's glory will be shown through the Son. If you ask me for anything in my name, I will do it. That's from the Sounds good news. Like quite an open invitation. Yeah. The key understanding in this I verse. Want a new car. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. The key understanding this verse, uh, the key to understanding this verse, are the words "in my name." What Jesus says was saying, what Jesus was saying, I'm sorry, was that if we have come to know Him well enough to know what His ultimate will for us is, that is what is ultimately best for us, and we ask for that, God will do it at the right time. Maybe not right when we want it, but he'll do it when he knows it's right. So we have to ask for the right thing, and then God will do it. At the right time. <laughs> so I don't get my new car. Huh? Not right now. Not right now. <laughs> and when you get to heaven, you know, I you have a... need a new car. I have, I have a friend that used to talk to high, a lot to high school students and college students. He said... You know, I'm sure you, you guys especially love to drive fast cars and so forth like that. But he says, when we get to those golden streets, I can assure you, your hot rod will be the slowest thing around. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I always I remember that. I had to chuckle about that. These were spoken at a time when Jesus was preparing his disciples for his departure. They did not understand it. I mean, gee, why, why are you going away? We're just about, I mean, we're just about to get you set up as the king of, of our, our country here. You can, you can conquer the world for us. Well, they had no idea what was implied by his departure. So Jesus assured them, and I think we have time to read some of this. Look at John 14. Do not be worried and upset, Jesus told them. Believe in God and believe also in me. There are many rooms in my Father's house, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. I would not tell you this if it were not so. And after I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to myself so that you'll be where I am. And I remember one pastor talking about this and he said, 
hmm, he must have had frequent flyer miles. <laughs> <laughs> you know the way that leads to the place where I'm going, and so forth. So from the writings of Ellen G. White, nothing is apparently more helpless, yet really more invincible than the soul that feels its nothingness and relies wholly on the merits of the Savior. God would send every angel in heaven to the aid of such a one rather than allow him to be overcome. Testimonies, volume 7, page 17. What an incredible statement. I had that highlighted, but the highlighting didn't come through for some reason. Jesus was dying in the Garden of Gethsemane as God withdrew his spirit from him, and yet he prayed faithfully. I mean, surely there were no problems with Christ's prayer. But notice that God did send an angel to strengthen or resuscitate Jesus, or he would have died because of the separation caused by sin right there in the garden. And who was hoping that he wouldn't die right there in the garden? Disciples, I guess. I don't know. Well, no. The one who really hoped he wouldn't die right there in the garden was Satan. Because he hadn't gotten him to succeed. Satan had succeeded with getting him to, to be tempted or any of the things he was trying to. So when Jesus was resuscitated, oh, good, now we have another chance. Think of what, think of what he went through after that. So right so there we have... why did God resuscitate him? Well, imagine, that's a good question, a fair question. Suppose that Jesus had just died right there of separation from God of sin, basically. In the garden. In the garden. The disciples would have woke up in the morning and they went over and, huh, he's dead. And they would have thought it's a heart attack or a stroke or something else like they would have had no idea what this was all about. It was only the things that happened after that that, you know, began to make it clear to our minds and then later revelations, which are special for us to Ellen White, that made it clear what exactly was going on. We can put after you have someone explain it, like Ellen White, then you could put the pieces back together, like this Luke 22, 40, 43, an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Um, but that's the way God is. You know, good teachers repeat themselves. Well, the disciples had that lesson on the road to Emmaus. Yep. You know, they kind of will. Oh, He, he did it again. <laughs> yeah. Imagine, and so here we are, talking about what you're, the road to miss. Imagine yourself in the upper room with the disciples on that Thursday night before the crucifixion. Then read John 14, 1 to 4. I just read you a few verses there. And try to imagine how you would have been involved and how you would have responded. When considering God's power, we need to remember that he created the entire universe. We don't have, we don't have the faintest idea how large the universe is. I remember back in the early days of the Hubble telescope, and the first th one of the first things they did is try to get it to map the entire sky. And of course, many things showed up that we had no idea about, that we, we, have never, we were never able to see with any of the telescopes we had before that. Because and of all the distortion of the atmosphere. Distortion and other things that might have been in the way or whatever. Yeah, and so someone says, okay, I have an idea. Let's pick a spot where there's nothing and let's focus, like two weeks, we'll have the Hubble focus on just that, that space where there's nothing, and see. And <laughs> they ended up saying there was, I think, 17 galaxies and hundreds of stars from <laughs> that spot where there was, there was, quote, nothing. So anyway, when considering God's power, we need to remember that he created the entire universe. He created every living being, in fact, everything. We can absolutely trust him to recreate us at the second coming. See, if you don't believe that God was able to create us back in the beginning, what's going to happen when it comes time for him to recreate us? I mean, I don't, I don't think a lot of people have thought about that. Satan had claimed that he was equal with Christ and should be treated as such. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus answered the questions and refuted the allegations of Satan in the great controversy. The fact that Christ rose from the grave in his own power was the ultimate proof that Christ was more than a creature. He was God, a creator, 
and was not like Satan, a mere creature. When he died and then rose on Sunday morning, the great controversy was won. Jim, I think that's yours. Uh, from Ellen White, when the voice of the mighty angel was heard at Christ's tomb saying, Thy father calls thee, the Savior came forth from the grave by the, f by the life that was in himself. Now was proved the truth of his words. I lay down my life that I may take it again. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. Now was fulfilled the prophecy he had spoken to the priests and rulers. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. John 17, excuse me, John 10, verses 17, 18, and verse, chapter John 2, yeah. 19, from Ellen White, The Desire of Ages, page 785, paragraph 2. I... <clears throat> We shouldn't speak evil about people, but I, I love to say things like that about the devil. Can you imagine Jesus coming out of the grave and you know, he, he's, the angel came down and the hundred Roman soldiers were flattened. But before they were flattened, Satan's entire host were scattered. They couldn't stand in the way of uh, one or two angels coming from heaven, they, they just scattered. And then, you know, one of those angels rolled back the stone and the other angel said, Jesus, your father calls you. And he came forth in his own power. And the reason I mentioned Satan earlier is Jesus could have turned to Satan right there at that point in time and says, you think you are a creator? Try that. <laughs> just try raising yourself from the dead. Salvation is not based on some legal arrangement. It is based on a personal relationship with God that transforms us into his image. Carrie? Reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. All of us then reflect the glory of the Lord with uncovered faces, and that that same glory coming from the Lord, who is the Spirit, transforms us into his likeness into an ever greater degree of glory. That's from the Good News Bible. Remember, Rem uh, remember that God plans to use his resurrection power on us unless we are still alive at his second coming and we get translated. In Ephesians 1, 18 to 20, we'll look at this in a moment, Paul talked about the power of God. What does this text teach us about the power of the resurrection? What hope and promises for yourself can you find in these verses? So think about this. What promises are in, in these verses just for you? Charles? Ephesians 1, 18 to 23. I ask that your minds may be open to see his light so that you will know what is the hope to which he has called you. How rich are the wonderful blessings he promised his people, and how very great is his power at work in us who believe. This power working in us is the same as the mighty strength which he used when he raised Christ from death and seated him at the right hand, right side of the heavenly world. Can I interrupt there for just a second? You notice here it sounds like God raised Christ. But we just read a passage from Ellen White that said Christ rose. In fact, two passages from Jesus himself saying that he, he has the power to lay down his life, he has the power to take it up. We shouldn't have a problem with that because, I mean, says, Dr. Maxwell always used to use this illustration, said, suppose you buy a piece of property and you want to build a house. Okay, you might tell your friends, I'm going to build a house, but you'll probably never take a hammer in hand. But you get you get in a now I don't Myra, are you taking a hammer in hand? <laughs> yes she is. <laughs> okay. But you get an architect and you in that and you know, you know, all the steps you go through and finally gets finally someone's down there putting up the walls and hammering the nails and all that kind of stuff, and every one of you could say, uh, we built this house. It's the same way. God says he did his part and Jesus did his part. So okay. Go ahead, Carrie. Uh, I was listening. 21? It's me. Yeah. I'm sorry, Charles. Oh, okay. 
Christ rules there above all heavens, rulers, heavenly rulers, authorities, powers, and the lords. He has a title superior to all titles of the authority in the world. And in the next, God put all things under Christ's feet and gave him the church as supreme Lord over all things. This happens in the third coming. Yeah. The church is Christ's body, the completion of him who himself completes all things everywhere. Okay, very good. God has promised us that he will give us divine power if we will hold fast our faith in him. This is incredible. Look at that, Myra. Second Peter 1, 4. In this way, he has given us a very great and precious gifts he promised so that by means of these gifts, you may escape from the destructive lust that is in, this, in the world and may come to share the divine nature. Good News Bible. Gordon? From Ellen White, Desire of Ages. The prince of this world cometh, said Jesus, and hath nothing in me, John 14, 30. There was in him nothing that responded to Satan's sophistry. He did not consent to sin. Not even by a thought did he yield to temptation. So it may be with us. Is it really? Read on. Christ's humility was united with divinity. Christ's humanity was united with divinity. He was fitted for the conflict by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And he came to make us partakers of the divine nature. There you go. So long as we are united to him by faith, sin has no more dominion over us. God reaches for the hand of faith. <clears throat> God reaches for the hand of faith in us to direct it to lay hold, to lay fast hold upon the divinity of Christ that we may attain to perfection of character. Desire of Ages 123. If we have, if we become partakers of the divine nature, would that make us perfect? To become partakers of the divine nature is a major theme in the writings of Ellen White. She uses that expression 875 times in her writings, that exact expression, partakers of the divine nature. Paul was trying to encourage us to understand that even if we should die, whether a martyr's death or not, that's not the end. We have the hope of the resurrection, and we know that God has the power to raise us to life. And that power, the power of creation and recreation, will continue to rule the universe for all eternity. So why do we worry? In our Bible study guide, there's a note. There's a plaque that some people have in their homes that reads, quote, why pray when you can worry? <laughs> Close quote. It makes us laugh because we know how often we worry rather than come to God and give him our concerns. Someone once said that when our life becomes all tied up, we should give it to God and let him untie the knots. How God must long to do this for us. Yet amazingly, we manage to hang on to our problems until we are about to snap. Why do we wait until we are desperate before we go to the Lord? That's our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Wednesday, August 17. So what should we do when we are faced with anxieties, worries, doubts, and other such problems? Jim? Psalms chapter 55, verse 22. Leave your troubles with the Lord, and he will defend you. He never lets honest people be defeated. Good News Bible. And Matthew 6, we won't take time to read it right now, but you know that's a whole section where God talks about the way he, he, he would like to care for you and love you and so forth. It's from the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah, part of the Sermon on the Mount. How are we supposed to understand Peter's words that Jim just read for us? How can we teach our young people to trust in God and allow him to help them through all their troubles? Let's look at it again. Carrie? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, dear. Okay. First Peter. First Peter 5, 7. Leave all your worries with him because he cares for you from the Good hmm. News Bible. This is a very simple text. There is no secret hidden in it. It means exactly what it says. To cast means... No, in, in King James it says, cast all your cares upon him. So, it's using the word cast. Go ahead. To 
Podcast means to do just that, to throw, to give away, so that what is causing the aching and the concern no longer has any connection to you. But, of course, our burdens are not thrown just anywhere. Our worry does not disappear into a void. It is given to our Father in heaven who has promised to sort it out. That is what Jesus is telling us in the verses in Matthew. The problem in doing this is not that it is hard, rather it is that it just seems too easy, too good to be true. I mean, that should be just, God says do it, just do it, right? No problem. So why don't we just make these claims upon God every day and live a trouble-free life? First, First of all, I'll pick that there. First of all, that is exactly what the devil is trying to prevent in our lives. He doesn't want us just depending upon God 100%. So why do we hang on to our troubles and our anxieties? Do we actually feel that we can sort them out better than anyone else can? Charles? From our Bible study guide. What are the things that cause you to worry now? However legitimate they are, however troublesome they are, is there anything too hard for the Lord? Maybe our biggest problem is that even though we believe that God knows about it and can fix it, we don't believe that He will resolve it and the way we would like it resolved. <laughs> God, could you please do it my way? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Dwell on that last point and ask yourself how true it is in your own life. Uh, the Bible study guide for Wednesday. Try to imagine the emotions and challenges to the think of the Jewish people in Babylonian captivity. Many years earlier, Isaiah had written for their benefit and for ours. Naira? Isaiah 40, 11. He will take care of his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs together and carry them in his arms. He will gently lead their mothers. That sounds like a very nice... Yes. Very. So yes. Isaiah understood the superiority of Israel's God, Yahweh, over all false gods. Gordon, you can give us some more there from Isaiah 40. Later in the same chapter, this is uh, actually... Part of what I read at our at our wedding. Oh, yeah. mm. almost almost fifty years ago. Not yeah. quite fifty you years. You were looking ago. for lots of troubles and, to come. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but this was the prelude to a song that was sung. Good, so, wonderful. Israel, why then do you complain that the Lord doesn't know your troubles or care if you suffer injustice? Don't you know? Haven't you heard? The Lord is the everlasting God. He created all the world. He never grows tired or weary. No one understands his thoughts. He strengthens those who are weak and tired, even those who are young grow weak. Young people can fall exhausted, but those who trust in the Lord for help will find their strength renewed. They will rise on wings like eagles. They will run and not get weary. They will walk and not grow weak. And we actually ended with the, they will rise on wings like eagles and then yeah. a song about, yeah. you will fly like an eagle. Wonderful. That's great. Think about the experience of the children of Israel in the days of Esther. It is interesting to notice that the book of Esther does not mention the name of God even once. Why do you think that is? Got any idea why they... Book of Esther doesn't mention the name of God even once. Well, it may have been written partly by Esther. She obviously knew the story. Um, we're inclined to think it was written probably by Ezra, not Esther. Ezra came along a little, a few years later. Um, we don't know, but it, most of it took place in the in the confines of the. Medo-Persian Empire, and uh, maybe they felt that it wasn't appropriate to mention the name of God, something like that. I don't know. Anyway, it's interesting to notice that the book of Esther does not mention the name of God even once. Why do you think that is? And yet, by how the story worked out, we know that God was working. 
Esther finally approached the king, having told her cousin that, quote, even if I perish, I perish, close quote. The same God who saved his chosen ones in the story of Esther will save them again in the final crisis. And what do we know about that final crisis? I think, Jim, that's yours. Revelation chapter 13, verse 15. The second beast was allowed to breathe life into the image of the first beast so that the image could talk and put to death all those who would not worship it. From the Good News Bible. So, may I remember the story? Revelation 13 is God's, I mean, is Satan's challenges, what he's going to do. And Revelation 14 is God's response, what he's going to do. And so what is this? Satan is just blatantly saying here, anyone who's not on my side is going to die. That's basically what he's saying. Okay, you want to go ahead? Ellen White says, has not God said he would give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And is not this spirit a real, actual guide? Some men seem afraid to ask God at his, <clears throat> to take God at his word as though it would be a presumption in them. They prayed for the Lord to teach us and yet are afraid to credit the pledged word of God and believe we have been taught of him. So long as we come to our Heavenly Father humbly and with a spirit to be taught, fulfillment of his no. own, excuse me. Willing and anxious. Should, to, to be taught, willing and anxious to learn. Yeah, I, I jumped You dropped there. a line there. Okay. Why should we doubt God's fulfillment of his promise? You must not be, you must not for a moment doubt him and dishonor him thereby. When you have sought to know his will, your part in the operation with God is believed, excuse me, is to believe that you will be led and guided, blessed and blessed by the doing of his will. We may mistrust ourselves lest we misinterpret his teachings, but make even this a subject of prayer and trust him. Still trust him in the uttermost, that his Holy Spirit will lead you to interpret aright his plans and the working of his providence. From Illinois, a letter, number 35 from 1893 to... Written from Australia to Brother and Sister Kellogg. Okay, and going on there? Ellen White also says, uh, faith grows strong by coming into conflict with doubts and uh, opposing influences. The experience gained in these trials is of no more value... Is more, of is, more value. Is of more value than the most costly jewels. Ellen okay. White, <laughs> Testimony of the Church, Volume 3, page 555. Paragraph two. Okay. How many things do you believe in that you cannot see? What about all the events in history which you were not there to see? Think of the billions of things that are visible under the various kinds of microscopes which we could never see with our own eyes. Think about the galaxies and stars that are way beyond our human vision, but we believe they exist after seeing them through the Hubble or some other such telescope. Does Faith actually grows stronger as it is challenged that we trust in God. By the way, the new telescope that they just shot out there into space is going to be, what, take several months before it finally gets ready to go. They're going to go, they're going to see back to creation. Mm -hmm. They don't call it creation, of course. They call it the Big Bang. Yeah, yeah it'll be interesting. They'll just find that there's more galaxies out there that they didn't know about. Does faith actually grow stronger as it is challenged that we trust in God? Carrie, that's... Oh, I was thinking well, about what you were saying about the telescope. Yeah. How much evidence do we have for the truthfulness of the Bible, for the character of God, for the power of God? Okay, there you go. Uh, our faith grows out of the evidence of God's promises and fulfilled prophecies. Evidence of God's creation, evidence of God's providence, providence rather, and care for us in our personal or collective histories. Evidence of his love for us in the incarnation of the Son when God became flesh and walked with us and died in our place. That's from John 1, 1 to 3, 14, John 3, 16, 36. And evidence that in the resurrection 
of Christ, he has power over evil, sin, suffering, and death. And that's from Ephesians 1, 18 through 21. By this evidence, the biblical believer sees the invisible by faith. And that's from Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study 106. Uh, okay. Charles, why don't you take yes. on the next verses there? 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Meanwhile, these things, these three remain, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of them is love. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. No one can please God without faith. For whoever comes to God must have faith that God exists and rewards those who seek him. So if faith, as we learned back at the beginning of our study, as faith is a relationship with God, how could you have a relationship with someone that you don't, you don't believe exists mm -hmm. or that you know nothing about? Doesn't make sense. Okay, go ahead. John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world, so oh. much loved the world, that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not die but have eternal life. Myra, you want to take off the next yeah. couple there? Ephesians 1, 18 to 21. I ask that your minds be open to his light so that you will know what is the hope to which he has called you. How rich are the wonderful blessings he promises his people and how very great his power to work in us who believe. The power, this power working in us is the same as the mighty strength which is used when he raised Christ from death and seated him at the right side in the heavenly world. There again, a reference to one part. Yeah. Yes. Christ rules there above all heavenly rulers, authorities, powers, and lords. He has a, a title superior to all titles of authority in this world and in the next. Good news, Bible. So this lesson has focused on two major themes. One, doubt arises when we do not trust God for the best solution to our problems. Two, the greatest foundation for our faith is Christ, his incarnation, sacrifice for us, and resurrection. Jesus is God, God's evidence that he can carry our sins, suffering and death upon himself so that we may overcome our crucibles from our Bible study guide, the teacher section, page 106. Jacob had two visions of God that we know about. The first was on his way to Haran, when he, on his way running from Esau away, sent off to Haran to try to find a wife. That's the place Bethel. Uh, Bethel. Bethel. Bethel, the house of God. Bethel, house of God. Bethel. The first was on his way to Haran where, when he stepped in the wilderness with a rock for a pillow and saw the ladder reaching between earth and heaven. His second vision occurred when he actually struggled with Jesus Christ himself. You can read the entire story in Genesis 32. We don't have time to do that right now. But after that struggle, Jacob said, I have seen God face to face. I want you to think about that for a moment. He struggled with him for, it must have been several hours. And, I mean, how was he fighting in the complete dark? Or did he really see him? It says, I've seen God face to face. What did he see? I, you know, we're led to believe it was a physical struggle. Yeah. Was it? Was well, it at the end, well, at the end, he, he tucks it, touches him on the hip and throws his hip out of joint. Yeah. So there's, that's very physical. And to this day, they're not going to eat. Something. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> there, yeah. That was, that was very physical. But to me, it was, um, I will not let you go unless you bless me. I think that's, yeah. that's, that's what, what he said. Yes. The other person in the Bible who is described as having seen God face to face was Moses. Look at the following passages. Exodus 33, 11, the Lord would speak with Moses face to face just as someone speaks with a friend. 
Numbers 12, 8, the Lord said, So I speak to him face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He has even seen my form. And I'm going to interrupt there for a second. Uh, we may run over some time here, but I, this is a story. Remember when Miriam starts complaining about the fact that Moses is married to someone who is not an Israelite. And some, there's some hint that she may have been darker skinned. And so God says, Moses, Aaron, Miriam, stand right over here. <laughs> and he says, Miriam and, jo and Aaron, step forward. <laughs> and then he says these words. And by that time, you'd be yeah. <laughs> shaking. <laughs> I think, yeah, what would your blood pressure be at that point? So God and, is saying to Aaron and Miriam about Moses. Yeah. I speak to him, Moses, face yep. to face. Exactly. Clearly and not in riddles. He has seen even my form. That's that's amazing that God would make a statement about that like that to a human being. But by the way, the Israelites watched this happen. Yeah, sure they did. Okay, go ahead. And in Deuteronomy thirty four ten, there has never been a prophet in Israel like Moses. The Lord spoke with him face to face. Would you call the Sinai experience a face-to-face -face encounter with God? Deuteronomy 5, 4 says, Moses said to Israel, and he's talking, trying to tell them about God, there on the mountain the Lord spoke to you, Israel, face-to-face -face from the fire. What kind of face-to-face -face experience was that? Terrifying experience. <laughs> We, terrifying for the for the people. Mm -hmm. Exodus thirty three eighteen to twenty three. He could have spoke to them face to face. They had their faces in the dirt. <laughs> they wouldn't. Have yeah, spoken. exactly. Well, think about the story now. They saw that incredible experience on the mountain. There's a black cloud. There's lightning shaking, shooting out, and the whole mountain is shaking. And they're down with their faces in the dirt, and then a, a little while later, God says, Moses, come on up here. And Moses starts, I mean, and, and he disappears into the black cloud or into the fire or whatever. And you would say, We haven't seen him for a long time. <laughs> we haven't seen him for a long time. Is he alive or is not alive, you know? Well, here's what the story that follows up, that follows that experience. Exodus 33, 18 to 23. Then Moses requested, please let me see the dazzling light of your presence. Now Moses, this is, has to be an experience that was happening at the top of Mount Sinai while they're up there together. Quote, the Lord answered, I will make all my splendor pass before you and in, my, in your presence, I will pronounce my sacred name. I am, and the word there in Hebrew is Yahweh, the Lord, and I show compassion and pity on those I choose. I will not let you see my face because no one can see me and stay alive. But here is a place beside me where you can stand on a rock. When the dazzling light of my presence passes by, I will put you in an opening in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away and you will see my back, but not my face. But then God later says, on, earlier before that, and then later, he said, but Mo, I have spoken to Moses face to face. We do not know exactly how these face to face encounters actually took place. Did Jesus Christ appear in human form? He certainly did that during his life on this earth, or did he appear only in vision? He certainly did that on numerous occasions, the prophets and apostles down through the generations. Could God appear to us in our day? Yes. Jim? From the Bible study guide, we cannot see God as he is in his divine nature. We are in the universe. God is with us, but he, has, but he also is transcendent or beyond our reality. We are fin finite. God is infinite. Moreover, we are sinful. God is holy. That is why we simply cannot see God as he is in himself. But we can see what and how he chooses to reveal himself to us. What he reveals to us is glory, excuse me, to us is, is his glory in the universe, which is 
his creation and the domain of the excuse me of his kingdom we reveal his love and care for us through his re revelations and providence for this reason in hebrews 11 verses 1 and 6 the apostle paul concludes that in the context of sin faith is quotes seen the evidence and prophetic revelations of god's existence and presence with us love for instance is materially unseen but it is evident in the manifestation of the person who loves us. From the Bible Study Guide, page 107. Yeah, the Apostle John reassured us about the reality of the Incarnation in the first chapter of 1 John. I love this section. He said, and when you study Greek, this is where you start. It's very simple Greek, and it's, it's, you, you know, it's language that you can understand easily. He said, Jesus was here. We saw him, we heard him, we touched him. And back in the Old Testament, David said in Psalm 37, 34, 7 and 8, Gary? Uh, his angel guards those who honor the Lord and rescues them from danger. Find out for yourself how good the Lord is. Happy are those who find safety with him. That's from the Good News Bible. Do you like that? Find out for yourself how good the Lord is instead of taste and see that the Lord is good? <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Jesus himself promised us that he would send the Holy Spirit to be with us. John chapter 14, 16 to 18. I'll ask the Father and he will give you another helper who will stay with you forever. He is the Spirit who reveals the truth about God. The world cannot receive Him because it cannot see Him or know Him, but you know Him because He remains with you and is in you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Verse 18. 18. When I go you will not be left alone. I will come back to you. And then you want to Bible. do John 16, 14 okay. also? He will give me glory because he will take what I say and let it to you. Tell it to you. Tell it to you. So what is the role of the resurrection in our understanding of salvation? If Jesus had not risen from the grave, how would we be changed? 1 Corinthians 15 verses 12 to 17. Now, since our message is that Christ has been raised from death, how can some of you say that the dead will not be raised to life? If that is true, it means that Christ was not raised. And if Christ was not raised, has not been raised from death, then we have nothing to preach and you have nothing to believe. More than that, we are shown to be lying about God, because we said that he raised Christ from death. But if it is true that the dead are not raised to life, then he did not raise Christ. For if the dead are not raised, neither is Christ, has Christ been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is a delusion and you are still lost in your sins. Mm. We some, I mean, he, he, he really yeah. pounded that, that point, didn't he? We sometimes wonder why God allows such terrible things to happen to some of us, even allowing some to die. But God can allow that because he also has the power to resurrect them. In fact, he will resurrect everyone who has ever lived, either at the second coming or the third coming. And prior to that, each one will be judged faithfully according to what she or he believed and thought and practiced in his or her life. We will all be judged fairly. It is hard for us to see the big picture. That is why it is so important for us to remind ourselves of the great controversy as depicted in Revelation 12, 7 through 12, from its beginning in the courts of heaven before this world was created and not limit our understanding to our present time. And I'm gonna just read those verses. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon who fought back with his angels, but the dragon was defeated and he and his angels were not allowed to stay in heaven any longer. 
the huge dragon was thrown out, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan that deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and all his angels with him. Then he heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now God's salvation has come. Now God has shown his power as king. Now his Messiah has shown his authority. For the one who stood before our God and accused our brothers and sisters day and night has been thrown out of heaven. Our brothers and sisters won the victory over him by the blood of the lamb and by the truth which they proclaimed. And they were willing to give up their lives and die. And so be glad you heavens and all you that live there, but how terrible for the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you and he is filled with rage because he knows that he has only a little time left. So that's a pretty potent statement there. God sees our very brief lives on this earth as a very short interlude and his plan for us to live. It is his plan or in his plan to li for us to live forever. That's what he wants for us. If he allows us to die, there's just, that's just a temporary sleep until he resurrects us again. Notice these words. From the Bible Study Guide, Teacher's Edition. However, this argument applies to God only because he alone holds the power of resurrection. As no one in the universe apart from God possesses the power of creation and resurrection, no other being in the world can allow people to die or kill them and be justified in the allowance of such horrific acts. Hence, the prohibition of the sixth commandment of the human race in Exodus 20, 13. Thou shalt not kill. Yeah. For a good synthesis on the importance of resurrection for the Christian faith, see Josh McDowell in support of deity, the resurrection hoax or history. And the reference and is given there. Those things by Joss McDowell, he's written a number of books and they're very useful in trying to deal with, uh, they were written primarily for college age students and so forth, trying to deal with what we call, you know, apologetics, teaching people about what we should believe. How have you seen God actively working in your life as you reveal those events, do they strengthen your faith? How do you think you would survive in the time of trouble when Satan is absolutely determined to destroy every one of God's followers? He will even finally manage to guide the passage, guide to the passage of a worldwide law demanding that all who are on God's side be killed. We read that verse earlier. Remember we said that Revelation 13 is Satan's challenges, including this one, that he's going to destroy every one of God's followers. And then God responds in Revelation 14, which of course we don't have time to talk about now. Do you look forward to living in those times? Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we study such passages of these together and we think about the issues involved and try to understand the implications, we thank you so much for the reassurances that we get from you, from these texts which guide us and how to deal with problems, the crucibles that we're talking about in this series. May we not be afraid, but may we move forward taking you by the hand as we go through the deep experiences together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.